Hi, I'm Alina Khan, and I will be presenting the paper Universal Adversarial Perturbation uh, with my uh, partner, Kyle Rebello. Here are a few uh, things about the paper. This has been written by these four authors. It was published in CVPR 2017. It has 1100 plus citations. And this particular paper links back to uh, the paper Deep Fool that we covered in one of the previous presentations. Um, it was covered by Dr. Cardan and Marzia. Also the paper that we are presenting today, this was um, um, covered in, uh, in lecture two by Dr. Shah. So we hope you will be able to connect the dots today. Uh, a few, uh, some outline about our presentation. First, we'll talk about the motivation, then uh, definition, uh, then we'll see the contributions of this paper. We'll uh, see universal perturbations in detail, and then we'll talk about uh, universal perturbations for deep nets. We'll talk about cross model universality, visualizations, and fine tuning using these particular perturbations. In the end, we'll conclude by presenting for and against remarks. So let's talk about the motivation first. We know previously the computation of an adversarial perturbation for a new data point uh, required solving a data dependent optimization problem or a gradient computation. But the question is, can we find a single small image perturbation that pulls a state of the art deep neural network classifier on all images? So the authors um, say that yes, it is possible and they prove it, it in this particular paper. They uh, claim that universal perturbations ve vectors exist. And if you add such a perturbation uh, to natural images, then uh, you can fool uh, the neural networks successfully and the neural network will misclassify images with high probabilities. Uh, let's see the definition of these universal perturbations. These perturbations are universal, which means they are image agnostic. So if you see in this image, the images on the left are the original images. I hope you can see my cursor. The images on the left are uh, the original images. The image in the center, this is a universal perturbation. So if we add uh, this perturbation to all of these images, we see these are the images on the right, which are perturbed images. Uh, the labels have been changed after the addition of this universal perturbation. So previously it was a flagpole, now it is being predicted to be a Labrador. Same goes for other images. So the other point here is these perturbations are quasi imperceptible. So if you try to compare, although these images are very small, but if you try to look, the perturbations are not very visible to the human eye. Contributions are the major contributions of this paper. They proved the existence of universal image agnostic perturbations for um, six uh, deep neural networks, state-of-the-art neural networks. They provided an algorithm for finding such universal perturbations. They proved that uh, the perturbations that they are um, uh, computing are uh, generalizable uh, across images. They also provided proof for generalization across deep neural networks. So they said that these perturbations, these universal perturbations are doubly universal in nature. Um, and then they provide um, a detailed analysis of high vulnerability of deep neural networks to universal perturbations. And they uh, claim that there is a geometric correlation between different parts of the decision boundary, um, which due to which these universal perturbations can exist. So my partner, Kyle, will take it further. All right, so for universal perturbations, uh, we want to seek a vector such that uh, when the vector is added to image can you X. Do the slide show? Uh, can you put in a slideshow? It'll be better. Can you not see? Right now, it's not a, it's a presentation mode. Do the presentation mode. It's just uh, showing the slides. Just say present. Yeah, that's very good. Okay. okay so yeah, it's fine now. Okay. So uh, we want to seek a vector such that when the vector is added to uh, data point X, it misclassifies the data point for most X in the distribution, where uh, mu is the distribution of images, uh, K is classification function, and V is our perturbed vector. Um, this vector should also satisfy the following two constraints, where the P norm of the vector should be less than or equal to the expected magnitude, and the empirical fooling rate should be greater than or equal to the target threshold, where epsilon controls the magnitude and delta quantifies the desired fooling rate. So for the algorithm, um, our input is data points, classifier, desired LP norm, and desired accuracy. The output is the universal perturbation vector. 
And we start by initializing the vector to zero. And while the empirical fooling rate is less than or equal to the target threshold, we iterate through each data point. If the data point plus the universal vector is not misclassified, we compute the minimal perturbation that sends the data point to the decision boundary. And that is showing here where we find the minimum R where X, X of I plus V plus that R misclassifies the image. And then we update the universal perturbation by doing this projection operation. And for projecting the universal perturbation vector, we do that to make sure that um, the new vector stays within that first uh, condition where it's less than or equal to the expected magnitude. So to do that, we find the V prime where the V minus V prime is minimized and less than or equal to the epsilon there. So then we, as you saw in the algorithm before, we use the projection operator to update V. And then we perform iterations on this until the empirical fooling rate is greater than or equal to our target threshold. And to find that we sum all cases where the image is classified on K with the perturbation vector is not equal to the image classified on K without the perturbation vector for M data points. And M is the number of data points to use from the entire data set. M can be small and still compute an effective universal perturbation. So to visualize this, uh, we have this image here where the R of I is a classification region. Uh, v of I is your minimal perturbation vector to move outside of the classification region. And V is a universal perturbation vector. So it initially starts out at zero. And as the algorithm iterates, it adds these delta Vs so that the universal perturbation vector gets these points outside of the classification region. So when they performed their experiments, um, they estimated universal perturbations for the following six arch architectures. You can see the names. Um, they use the ILSVRC, the ImageNet validation set, which has 50,000 images. So from these 50,000 images, they pick the set of 10,000 images um, to calculate the perturbations. They're not using all for calculation at, at a single time. So in average, 10 images per class are being used. The results are being reported for P equals to um, two LP, uh, uh, L2 norm and L infinity, um, where um, epsilon has a value 20,000 and uh, 10 respectively. So the reason for choosing these numerical values are um, uh, is because um, you want to um, obtain a perturbation whose norm is significantly smaller than the image norm. Here are the results. So they reported the results on two sets. The first is, is the set X that has been used to compute the universal perturbation. And the other set is the complete validation set. So this set has images um, 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 that are not being used to compute the universal perturbation. You can see the graph on the screen. Uh, here are the columns uh, represent six different architectures uh, on which they have reported the results. The rows in, uh, represent the um, L2 norm and L infinity. And for each of these, we have the results for both the sets, X and the validation set. So uh, the cells represent the fooling rates. So you see for the CAFENET and for the VGGF architecture, the result is really good. Um, it's above 90% for the validation set. Uh, so the images that, that are not being used for calculation of universal perturbation, uh, they are being, um, the result is even good for those images. Uh, and if you look at the other architectures, you can see my cursor. Uh, for the VGG19, Google Net, and REST Net, you see the percentages are, the pooling rates are um, edging to 80%, which, which is good. Um, 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 here is one observation. Um, um, if you see, for some of the architectures, the L2 norm values are better than the L infinity. And for some other architectures, it's, um, it's the opposite of that, but we have not been able, the, there's no explanation provided for that in the paper, and we have not been able to come up with a conclusion for that. Maybe it has something to do with the architecture itself. So then they provided the proof of quasi-imperceptibility of these universal perturbations. Uh, they use the Google Net architecture. And um, you can see these images on your screen. These are being perturbed. And you can see that the perturbation is not noticeable. Uh, the initial uh, six images are from the validation set, while the last four are from uh, the author's mobile phone camera. 
They further provided visualization of universal perturbations for the six different architectures that we have been reporting results for. And uh, these images are generated with p equals to infinity and, um, and epsilon equals to 10. And the values have been scaled to, the pixel values have been scaled to Im improve the visibility. They further made a very interesting um, remark and they proved it. They said that these universal perturbations are not unique for a particular architecture. And when we say that, we mean that for any particular architecture, you can have more than one universal perturbation. So they showed these five different uh, perturbations for the Google Net architecture. Um, and you see, these are generated using different random shufflings of the same set X. So every time you shuffle the set X and get a different perturbation, although, um, it looks like these um, perturbations are exhibiting a similar pattern, but these are these, these are not similar because they calculated the normalized inner product for for pair of perturbations, and the result does not exceed 0.1. So uh, they, they they prove that uh, these look like they are similar, but they are different. And for one architecture, you can have many different universal perturbations. Then they uh, evaluated if the effect of size of the set X has an impact on the quality of the results. You can see the graph here. The X axis represents number of images. So you take five, they, they took 500 images, 1,000 images, and so on. The Y axis represents the fooling ratio. So you see when you take 500 images and you try to um, uh, compute the uh, you try to compute a universal perturbation, the result is 30 percent, which uh, more than 30 percent, which means more than 30 percent of the images can be fooled if you take only 500 images. And if you increase this number, the fooling ratio improves. But let's talk about this. Um, thirty percent rate. It looks like like we, we, you you may say that this is only thirty percent, but this is significant because if you re remember the number of classes in the in the image net set is only th uh, is, is thousand. So um, if we take five hundred images, it means that we are considering less than one image per class. So even the thirty percent um, um, ratio is not bad. And if you want to improve that, you can improve the you can increase the size of the um, of the set X. Uh, then they also proved the cross model universality for universal uh, adversarial perturbations. And you can see the results on this, uh, uh, on this graph. Here, uh, these rows indicate the architectures that they have used for the computation of the universal adversarial perturbations. And these columns here, they, they, these are the architectures on which they have tested these universal adversarial perturbations. The cells represent the fooling rates. So you can see uh, the diagonal here represents uh, the values when you are computing uh, the universal perturbations for a particular architecture and then testing it on the same architecture. So you see these values are good, especially for VGGF and CAFE that. And also, you see that universal perturbations for some architectures, like the VGG19 architecture, um, is good and it is able to generalize well across other architectures. Like for, for if you see, the lowest we get here is 53%. And for the other architectures, it's better than 53%. So we can say, um, and I, I have, um, accept that for some architectures, it's not generalizing uh, that well. Like you can see 39%. Um, so we can claim uh, that for some architectures, the universal perturbations generalize, generalize very well across other architectures, and for some others, it may not generalize that well. So they also visualized the effect of universal perturbations, and for that, they created a graph G, and we know a graph consists of two uh, uh, two things of uh, vertices. So in our case, the vertices are the labels of the class and edges. Um, we are using directed edges here, uh, here, and for um, so if you see this graph, you'll be able to understand it better. So these vertices are the labels. And if you see a directed um, um, edge from this label to this level, it means that the images from this particular class have been fooled into this particular label, right? So this is just a part of the graph that they um, that they um, made. Um, and this is basically a union of disjoint components. So you can see a second component here. And all these components are like these, these particular components are connected components, and then you have a union of all these disjoint components. Um, there's one more observation here. Um, you see that some labels are more dominant than others. And uh, the authors explained that they provided, uh, they tried to pro provide a hypothesis. Um, and they say that these occupy, these particular labels which are dominant, they occupy large regions in the image space. 
which is uh, why they are good candidate labels for fooling most of the natural images. But they have not proved this hypothesis um, uh, or they have not talked about it further. Okay, after all the visualizations, the author tried to fine tune a network. Uh, using a universal adversarial perturbation and later we will attack that so for fine tuning they use the vggf architecture by modifying the training set here is the procedure for each for each training point um uh, a perturbation is added with a probability of 0.5 which means that some of the um, images or the data points in the original set are preserved while some are not and the probability is 50 uh, percent um they pre-computed a pool of 10 different universal perturbations and from this this pool of uh, uh perturbations they picked uh randomly and they trained five extra epochs on this modified training set so after uh, fine-tuning this network they evaluated how good it is and for that they computed um, a new universal perturbation so that they can attack this right uh, so after these five extra epochs that we spoke about, the pooling rate on the validation set, uh, uh, the new rate was 76.2 percent. And if you um, compare it with the with the previous rate, without the fine fine tuning thing, it was 93.7 percent. So the pooling rate has decreased after fine tuning, and it's 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 a good good thing. And um, of course, after this result, they tried to repeat the same procedure again, hoping that this will improve further, like the fooling rate will reduce further. Uh, and they repeated the same, same procedure that was mentioned on the previous slide. But this time, the new fooling rate was only uh, was 80%. So it was not better than this one, like, you see? So they, they, uh, they concluded that the repetition of this procedure does not guarantee that you will be able to improve the, um, uh, improve the network. Uh, so you can fine tune the network, but it's not guaranteed and you can do it to a particular extent only. Right, so that the best that they could achieve was 76.2%. They reduced the fooling rate after fine tuning. So this is the final conclusion for this. And um, I'll give the control back to Kyle. Okay, so to understand the characteristics of the universal perturbations, we compare it to different types of uh, perturbations. So. We have a graph here which shows uh, each perturbation's fooling rate on the ImageNet validation set with respect to the L2 norm here on the bottom. So the, as you can see, the universal perturbation reaches high fooling rate quickly. And if, um, if you take a look at, even if you constrain it down here to a, a norm of 2000, you can see that the fooling rate is 85% while the fooling rate on random vectors is just 10%. So um, this large difference suggests that there's a geometric correlation in a decision boundaries, which we'll explore next. So to compare the uh, random versus universal perturbation, we take a look at the uh, distances to the decision boundary using the norm. So the norm of the random perturbation required to fool a specific data point is this square root of D times the L2 norm of R. And for where D is the dimensions of the input space and uh, the norm is the distance between the data point and the boundary. So for the in, image net classification task, this is roughly equal to 20,000. And if you remember from the previous slide, the universal perturbation norm is just 2000. So this suggests that the distance to the decision boundary of random perturbations is 10 times greater than the decision boundary distance is seen with universal perturbation. Um, so to further explore this, we, we want to capture the decision boundary geometry. Um, so for each image X in the validation set, we compute the adversarial perturbation vector R of X so that when the X is added to the image, it is misclassified and uh, Rx is normal to the decision boundary, which allows us to capture the geometry of the decision boundary uh, around that point. So to find a correlation between different regions of the classifiers, we define a matrix N, where N contains normal vectors to the decision boundary for N data points from the validation set. So, we 
plot these different uh, singular values of the matrix N, and then we also plot the singular values from um, from a random vector in N. And these, uh, so we get the singular values here, which uh, determine how well the data is approximated by the matrix. And then the index is the number of images, which can be from zero to 50,000. So the uh, fast decaying line here for the normal vectors means that we were able to approximate the data in N with relatively few images as we've seen before. So this uh, further confirms the existence of a correlation in the decision boundary. So to visualize this, we have this, uh, the paper made a hypothesis about a low dimension subspace. And basically you have the uh, S, which is this region here, and X of I, your data points here, and your adversarial perturbations for each of them, and your decision boundary. And as you can see, um, the normal vectors in here, all in the same region, uh, means that any perturbation belonging to the subspace is likely to fool data points. And to verify this, uh, the paper selected a random vector of norm 2000 belonging to that subspace S. And they found that the fooling ratio from that vector was computed at 38%. This is compared to just 10% when doing random perturbations. So this means that a random direction in S outperforms random perturbations. So this helps explain why the universal perturbation generalizes so well. So for our conclusion, we showed the existence of small universal perturbations that can fool state-of-the-art classifiers on natural images, uh, proposed an iterative algorithm to generate universal perturbations, and we highlighted several properties of this universal perturbation, the fact that it is image and network agnostic, uh, explain the existence of universal perturbations with correlations between different regions in the decision boundary, and provided insights on the geometry of the decision boundaries of these deep neural networks. So for the four, uh, this algorithm is able to generate a universal perturbation with a small sample of the data, uh, finding the subspace that allows the universal perturbation to be so effective uh, finding correlations between the different parts of the decision boundary, and the, as mentioned before, the universal perturbation is image and network agnostic. So for the, uh, against. Okay. Yeah, Alina. So um, uh, my, um, uh, my standard is that they, they, they used only a single data set of natural images, image set for all their experiments. So maybe they, um, the results are coming from only a single data set. The, the proposed method is expensive because it's iterative. Um, they perform fine tuning on just a single architecture, VGGF, out of the six architectures uh, that they have been talking about, they picked one. Um, fine tuning procedure um, uh, helped improve the pooling rate, but it's not guaranteed to uh, fully immune the uh, network. And their hypothesis for the dominant labels need to be investigated. They presented the hypothesis just once and there was no comments on that or no proofs. 